This GTEC A10M is an Ender 3 clone with a difference. It's got color mixing dual extrusion. It's got amazing potential, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for everyone. Let me tell you why. I've spent the last few weeks printing pretty much non-stop and experimenting with this printer, a GTEC A10M. Yes, it is an Ender 3 clone, but it does have a difference. It has two extruders. There's a couple of other changes here, but the important details are it's the same price as an Ender 3 Pro. So how does it stack up? Well, I've printed a number of things trying to push the capabilities, and I'd love to take you through them. Let's start with how it's different to an Ender 3. Much of the printer is a direct clone of the Ender 3, and that includes some of the faults. For instance, it still needs a fan cover because the fan for the main board is facing straight up where filament is very likely to fall down. Besides the obvious difference of the dual extruders, there are some other features that have been added on. There's filament runout sensors, more on that one later. There is a glass bed similar to the style of an Ultra Base. That seemed to work quite well for me. This extrusion on the front here is rotated 90 degrees, so it's 40 mil wide instead of 20 mil wide. So on paper, at least that should be more stable. The main board, unlike the Ender 3, is not strangled by a limited 1284p chip. It's got the normal 2560, which means twice the capacity and no stuffing around when it comes to firmware. And yes, it does come with a bootloader. One of the nice touch with the electronics is the SD card. Instead of being a micro one on the front, we have a full size SD card slot on the side of the control panel. That's a big improvement in my opinion. Back to the extruders, yes there are two, but they are a different style to the Ender 3. They have a three to one geared extruder with this nice thumb wheel on the side, and that definitely assists in loading and unloading filament. In terms of noise, there are pros and cons. The power supply has a switching fan, so it only comes on when it needs to be. So potentially it will be more quiet, but unfortunately the fan for the hot end is running permanently. And let me tell you, it is quite loud. It sounds like a little turbine engine spinning up all the time. The final subtle little thing is the way this LCD lights up and it is yellow. For me, it's not personally my taste, but other people might like it and it is another point of difference compared to the Ender 3. Now onto the assembly. This was a fairly painless experience. There are some sub-assemblies that need to be bolted together, just like the Ender 3, and some things that are probably more detailed on this and less detailed in other ways. So an example of this is the X gantry that's already assembled with all the belts in place. However, the extruders need minor assembly, which doesn't have to happen on the Ender 3. The instructions were a nice double-sided one-page A4 affair. I probably would have liked some of the pictures to be a little bit bigger. There was a bunch of spares left over, and that was a good thing because the instructions had the wrong size bolts for the two filament runout sensors. On balance, a pretty minor oversight, so I can definitely forgive that. I think I had the whole thing together, filament loaded, bed leveled, ready to print in about 45 minutes, which I think is pretty good for a machine of this complexity with the dual extruders. The only real issue I had with assembly was the Z lead screw at the back. It was a little bit loose, it was a little bit misaligned, and some of my first prints had some Z wobble on the vertical surfaces. I think I have eventually tuned it out, but it's a little bit more finicky than other printers you might find. So I guess what most people watch review videos for is to find out what the print quality is like. I've got quite a few prints here in various styles, various materials. I'd love to take you through them. They tell quite a story about my experiences with this thing. On the SD card, there were three pre-sliced G-code files, and this was a good example of the three types of ways you can use the dual extruders. The first one I ran with was the Lizard. For this one, I used the two sample filaments that came with the machine, blue and yellow. And this is a nice print because it mixes the two colors out throughout the model, not just in vertical bands as if you were changing the color partway through. You'll notice one of the extruders clogged partway through. You'll also notice that there's a perch block for this, which is necessary to get a clean color change between the two different colors you're printing with on this type of model. Next up, I printed this dog here. And the thing about this one is it starts as one of the colors and fades through to another color. So we've got a nice gradient from green up to white. This is the second style of dual extrusion you can do with this printer. And although this mode was included in the G-code, you can also do this from the LCD menu, which I'll talk about shortly. Lastly, I did this traffic cone, and this is the type of thing you could probably replicate on another printer by pausing it and changing the filament part way up. So yes, it is a dual extrusion print in that whole sections of the model change color, but because it's happening in the vertical axis, you don't need a purge block like with the other ones. It just switches from one color and back and forth throughout the print. 
Well, my interest was piqued, so I started to look through the G-code to find out how these different types of prints were done. I started looking into the Marlin firmware commands, and I also found the firmware for this, which is kindly posted by GTEC online. The first thing I sliced and printed myself was this white to gold vase in PLA. Now the thing about this was I didn't do anything in the G-code and I utilized the features built into the LCD screen to get an effect similar to this color gradient changing dog. You'll notice on the main status screen of the LCD that it says mixer and it's got a percentage from one side to the other. If you navigate through the menus, you can set this manually, but you can also go to the template option and that lets you pick a starting height and ending height and then a gradient shift to do. I matched the 100 mils to the height of this vase and I told it to go from zero to 100% and that's exactly what it did. Really nice to know that you can get this type of effect without learning anything new in terms of slicing software or firmware. Next, I thought I would dip my toe in the water with a proper dual extrusion print and I did this little yin and yang. I sliced this one in Simplifier 3D with a matching tiny perch block and it turned out pretty good first time round. Time for something more challenging. Enter the hairy dual extrusion unicorn. So I left the same gold and white PLA from X3D in my machine and I sliced this one in Simplify 3D again and I let it rip. Once again, it has a purge block that has to match the height of the model and because of that, it slows things down a great deal. It might not look that big, but this actually took over nine hours to print. The end result, well, it was full of stringing. I have to say this is definitely a more difficult machine to get the settings for the slicer down pat. I did a fair amount of manual cleanup. I trimmed off the plate that holds all of the main bits and I broke out the hair dryer. This is the first time I've done one of these hairy models. I probably had the heat too high and the fan on the hair dryer up too fast. So I'm not entirely happy with it, but overall it turned out pretty cool. I've seen these hairy models before, but I've never actually seen a dual extrusion one. My daughter can't wait to get her hands on this after I publish this review. And that's definitely a good thing. Next up, the Benchy, but there's something particularly special about this one. It looks like it's only one color. The thing is, I don't have any pink PLA filament in stock. What I did when I started printing this was to mix on the LCD a tiny bit of red and mostly white, and then I let it run. One of the nice features of this machine is because of the color mixing, you don't have to do it in a gradient, but you can mix two colors together to make another color that you don't actually have in stock. I reckon that's a pretty good feature. As for the print quality, it's pretty good. It's not perfect. I need to dial the retraction in a little bit more and you'll notice on the nose here, it's a little bit melted and I think that's because the cooling fan blows from the front towards the back and it's probably not as efficient as on other printers. You'll also notice too, there are some light surface artifacts just like on the Ender 3. I thought it might be a good chance to try some different materials. So I eventually got this Pikachu printed from PETG. The first time I tried to print this, it stuck really well and then I had a clog up the top. I don't think the path that the filament goes in past the filament centers is optimal. I think the mount for the filament spool needs to be rotated 90 degrees and if I can't find anything on Thingiverse, I'll definitely be designing and printing my own. I had a couple of really random jams where it twisted around on itself here and that was really frustrating. Now this second time round version took about 12 goes to get right. For some reason, I just could not get it to stick on the base. Generally with PLA, this glass surface with the special texture on top was flawless. Things stuck really well and after they cooled down, I could just tap them off with my finger. It still worked pretty well with the PETG, but if there was anything sticking up just a little bit, you'll notice the nozzle underneath is quite wide instead of pointy. So it means that things catch and drag on it much, much easier. Eventually, I got this one to stick and printed. It's not too bad. Once again, the retraction is a little bit tricky to dial in with other printers. I need to put in some more work here getting that right. I then run the exact same model, just modifying the temperatures and turning off the fan to print it out of ABS. This one stuck and printed pretty much perfect first time around. I think in my opinion, the quality is pretty much on par with an Ender 3, minus the surface artifacts where I still need to dial in the retraction. Time to see just how flexible this printer is and that meant loading up TPU. I up the extruder temperature to about 240 and I slowed it down to 40 millimeters per second, which I'm sure you'll agree is a pretty good compromise for flexibles. This turned out nice and squishy. The surface quality is not the best, especially when you compare it to something done on my Cocoon Create Touch, which has a Flexion extruder and is set up specifically for flexibles. Not amazing, but definitely a pass and a bonus that this printer can handle it with its different extruder setup. That meant I was ready to step up to something more difficult. Enter the dual extrusion flexible octopus. I found this gem on Thingiverse. It took many hours to print. 
but the end result is really cool. The stringing on this was definitely a nightmare. Like I've kept on saying, it's gonna take a little bit more time to dial in the retraction settings. It's a bit trickier with the way it mixes the two filaments, but after some cleaning up, this one turned out pretty damn cool. If it was a bonus that this thing can print flexibles, it's amazing that you can do dual extrusion flexibles. That's something I don't really see in any other printer. Summing up pros and cons. Now I've really enjoyed this printer, but it hasn't been perfect. There's a few things that definitely need improvement. The way this filament feeds into the top, definitely an issue. And the filament sensors, when I checked and I updated the firmware, because it didn't have thermal runaway enabled, even though it was in that version of the firmware, the filament runout detection wasn't actually enabled either. So I haven't tested that because I don't see how it's actually going to work, but it should be pretty easy to turn it on and get that going. As I've referred to a few times, this printer is a little bit more finicky to get tuned in. So I had my issue with Z wobble on this back area here and an inexperienced printer might struggle dialing that out. And there's one of the worst artifacts you can have is when you've got wobble in your vertical walls. It really ruins the aesthetics of your prints. The other issue I had consistently, at least at the start before I solved the problem, was a lot of clogs. And it wasn't clogging down in the nozzle, it was clogging up here in the extruder. And that's because there's a tensioning system and they were quite loose the way they came from factory. I opened it up to have a look inside and understand how the mechanism worked. And after that, I was able to tension them up and I didn't have any more failures in that type of way. Now there's a few thriving Facebook groups. So there is a community for support here, but I'd have to say the documentation from GTEC is not really the best, but there wasn't really anything to talk you through setting up dual extrusion or anything in the instructions really explaining how to do that on the LCD. Onto the pros. Well, the build quality is pretty good. The print quality is quite good. And the main pro has to be the dual extrusion. I think most people will consider the glass bed an upgrade over the standard end of three. That's something you've got to pay extra for from Creality or buy your own any cubic ultra base if you're going to do it on the end of three. So it's nice that it's included in the original price point. The filament runout sensors when they're up and running will be nice too, because generally that's another thing that costs money on top of the purchase price of the printer. For me, by far the biggest pro on this printer is the amazing potential. I'm gonna be able to print things on this that I just can't even consider on many of my other printers. The fact that it's so versatile in being able to do ABS, PLA, PTG, and even flexibles in dual extrusion, I reckon is a real plus. I should also probably mention that this printer comes with two paid upgrades, and that is a Wi-Fi module and the GTEC ripoff version of the BL Touch. There's actually already a mount built into this, and where they host their firmware, they have a separate configuration file that you substitute in, and that has all of that set up ready to go as well. Coming up, well, I personally think this is amazing value when you consider it's the same price as an Ender 3 Pro. The extra features on this, such as the filament runout, the dual extrusion, the glass bed, definitely are worth the price compared to the Ender 3 Pro. This thing has got amazing potential. Having said that, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for everyone. Yes, you can use it just with one extruder, similar to an Ender 3, but there have been a lot of different things that have popped up that I've needed to troubleshoot along the way, and I fear a beginner might really struggle with that. So who is this printer for? I'd say two categories. People that want to experiment with dual extrusion, but don't want to spend a fortune, and maybe beginners who are particularly patient, maybe a little bit tech savvy and have the ability to patiently work through any issues that pop up. Personally, I'm really excited to own this one and I plan to use it for a lot of special projects. Expect a video coming up soon on some basic modifications to fix some of the things that I've complained about, as well as a full how-to guide for how to set up and print with dual extrusion. If you've got any more questions about my experiences with this printer, please post them in the comments. And until next time, thank you so much for watching and happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.